Welcome to Continuous Dream. Today, Part 2, Chapter 3 of Kells, The Gospel of Columba, a novel by Amy Kreider. Part 2, read by Lindsay Summers. Part 2. Chapter 3. The Rope. We could see the wood from a long way off beyond a deserted plain. The plain was crisscrossed with low stone walls, but there was no house as far as we could see. Ahead, there were the white blossoms of an apple tree beside a circular wall that might indicate a well, and we headed for it. We had not stopped to rest yet, and it was midday. The sky was hazy and bright, cast in greenish shadows. The apple blossoms perfumed the air when we arrived at the tree, and I tossed a pebble down the well. We heard the splash and smiled, unloading the tired mule in order to use the twine. We brought a small pail and a cup, and after we pulled up the pail of water, we passed the cup many times and drank our fill. We sat down under the tree and sparingly ate some dried meat. Do you know this well? I asked Alton. When I came before, I stayed to the edge of the wood rather than cross the plain, he replied. I didn't ask why he avoided the open plain, but he must have seen the question in my face. It was stormy and the wood sheltered me, he explained. So far, Fergic had hardly spoken, and he stretched out on his back. He was a big, strong lad with broad shoulders and large hands, and his lip and chin were lightly covered with pale brown hair. He kept his golden brown hair short, and it curled gaily on top of his head. He was humming quietly. Sing us a song, Deirdre said, flopping down beside him. Only if you sing with me. They sang rounds and their voices echoed in the bright, still air. I was looking at Alton who watched the singers, particularly Deirdre. "'You have a fine voice, both of you,' he said. "'Thank you,' the girl said, turning her head as if to look away or to hide a blush. They stopped singing. A crow landed on a nearby wall beyond the apple tree and started fluttering between the top of the wall and something just on the other side of it. Fergic noticed and got up to investigate. Fresh meat, he called. A deer has died here. No, Deirdre cried. He laughed. You are too tender. Animals don't die in their beds. But we can't stay here long enough to make use of it, I said. Why not? Fergic asked. Because we should continue, even now. He shrugged. Seems a waste. Without speaking further, we packed up. When we entered the woods, Deirdre asked, Could the deer have been poisoned by the well? And how could the little deer have reached the water? Fergic replied. The water was down a few feet. It tripped on the wall and broke its leg. We slipped into the woods, from the bright afternoon into green darkness, and the air was cool. Hawthorns bloomed among the hemlocks and oaks. Alton knew his way through the wood. Quicker, he said, than keep into the field and knew a cave by a spring where we could spend the night. The deeper in we went, the colder the air felt. At first, a flock of crows flew with us from tray to tray. But after a while, the flock turned off. We are a sorry lot, Fergic suddenly said, breaking the silence. We should be passing the time in merriment, stories and song. Why are we as sombre as a funeral? Nay, I've been to merrier funerals. We laughed. Then you start, I said to the boy. I see I am in charge of the entertainment, he replied. He started asking riddles. I am below and above the water. I glide like a swan, but I steal her eggs. An otter, said Deirdre. That was too easy. I live in packs of my kind, yet all men admire my solitude. The wolf, Alton said. I can be seen 
but I cannot be held. I can be felt, but not touched. I can be heard, yet I have no voice. Fire, I said. I cannot be stood upon, but I bear great weight. I can be drunk, but never quench your thirst. The sea, Deirdre said. He went on Ridlin as the trees grew thicker and more tangled. A chorus of birdsong and insects arose as it became dusk. Alton stopped and looked about. I think we've come to it, he said. He led us off to the left, and suddenly there was a large outcropping of rock and a cave opening in the earth, big enough for all of us. There were the remains of a fire, and it seemed like a commonly used place. Fergic struck a fire, and I gathered plentiful dead wood, while Alton sat with Deirdre and told her a story. Then Fergic went off to see if he could catch a squirrel or a rabbit. The three of us sat by the fire. We could hear Fergic tramping in the wood, but lost sight of him. Won't you sing again? Alton asked Deirdre. She smiled shyly. All right. Her sweet voice trembled in the air. Her song ended. It was dark, and Fergic did not return. I realised I couldn't hear his footfalls any more. Do you think Fergic is lost? I asked. Alton smiled. His teeth were big in the shadows of his face. Of course not. He doesn't know the woods. He's a clever lad. Deirdre leaned her head on my shoulder, and I wrapped my cloak around her. Suddenly there was a crashing sound of wings through the brush, a loud cackle, and then Fergic's step. He emerged from the trees carrying a large, round brown bird by its feet. I've snared a grouse and her eggs. It will do, he said. He gutted the bird and boiled it in the pail. After eating, we spread out to sleep. When I awoke, the woods were dark, but with the grey glow of dawn. Alton was feeding the fire. I'm glad you're up first, he whispered. His hoarse whisper blended with the hiss of the fire. Why is that? I want to talk with you. Come. He led me away by where the spring bubbled from the ground. He rubbed his hands. When Deirdre is old enough, I'd like to marry her, he said. I sighed. I'd half expected this. You're very old, and you have no property. She is blind. Her expectations are low. I spoke with the High King at Terra. This summer he will enforce my land rights with his men, for a share. I wasn't sure I had ever believed his story. It's up to Dermot. We'll see when we return, and we'll see when you get your land back. He nodded with a slight bow. That's fair. We set out again and walked until midday. We came to a clearing in the woods, where the sun dazzled out from under the dark trees. We spread our bedding to doze in the warmth, and then we boiled some oats in some of the milk. Alton took a small pair of scissors from his belongings and turned to me. I keep my hair very short, and it itches me when it grows. Would you mind trimming it? He loosened his robe, pulling the wide opening down to his thin chest. He knelt on the ground and I stood behind him. As I bent over him and started to clip his hair, I saw something that stopped my breath. Just under his left shoulder was the red scar of a deep gash. I felt dizzy, swaying in the heat. Are you all right? <clears throat> it's uh, just the sun. I clipped his grey hair and handed the scissors back to him. We're almost through the wood, Alton said. By nightfall we'll be in the open again. Then we'll make better time and be at the coast within days. I nodded dumbly. He startled me by seeming to read my thoughts. Those who took my land gashed my arm as a warning, he said. I'm sorry, 
It's a terrible wound. I'll have my revenge soon. He tied his tunic at the neck. In the clearing as we packed, I thought how to escape with Deirdre. But as we entered into the dark wood again, I reflected. Could the visitors have mistaken a gash below the left shoulder for one below the right elbow? They were so precise about it. Certainly he is Yvain, an evil man. I have done the wrong thing. I didn't trust my misgivings. Still, Fergic is with us, and he has done no harm by us. By now he may be repentant. We did not exit the woods before nightfall, and we stopped where a stream wound snake-like around small hills. Now we follow the stream in the morning, Alton said. It will take us into the fields of a man I know. He will shelter us tomorrow night. Fergic slapped him on the back. That will be a pleasant change. Are there fish in this brook? Aye. Fergic set up a line as he whistled a tune. I took Deirdre's hand and led her to the edge of the stream. We dipped the cup and drank. Why don't you gather wood? I called to Alton. At least now he may lift a finger to please me for Deirdre's sake, I thought. Fergic strung the line across the brook and joined Alton, and soon we had a lively fire and four trout to fry. While we ate, Alton told us the life of St. Brendan, who sailed to strange islands. When we scraped the last morsel from the bowl, Deirdre said, You like the stories of those who travel to far lands? Alton smiled. Yes, I am a wanderer, but I won't wander forever. I long to settle down again. The fire lighted Deirdre's face, so sweet and bright. When we come to Iona, it is such a holy place. I'm sure the monks will pray for you and your brother, and all will be well. His smile froze, and then he furrowed his brow in exaggerated puzzlement. My brother? Fergic was sitting between Deirdre and me and I couldn't squeeze her arm or nudge her without Alton seeing. Oh, I think I know your secret. We're friends, you can tell us. Are you not the holy man called Ewan? We heard the tale. Alton glanced aside, considering, and he frowned in thought. I am no more or less than what I say I am. He turned and took her hand, pressing it hard. Have no illusions about me or fears. I have nothing but a reputation is more a burden than any possession. I'm sure for the holy man, as well as his brother. There was something in this that made Deirdre shrink back and pull her hand from his. I caught Alton's eye and said, to dismiss it, the girl is too fanciful. But in that moment, I felt that he saw in my eyes the look that betrayed everything. And in his eyes, I saw a harsh, and angry gleam. His teeth smiled strangely. You must grow up, dear child, he said to Deirdre, but he didn't take his eyes off me. I have no choice but to grow up, Deirdre said, with directness that did seem mature. There are always choices, Alton said softly, almost warningly. Deirdre stood up and turned awkwardly, her blindness apparent in a way that was rare for her. I jumped up and put my arms around her. Deirdre was shaken, and I held myself still for her sake. I looked down at Alton, but he was staring at the fire now, absorbed in his own thoughts. Fergic did not seem to notice any of our discomfort. He looked up in surprise at Alton. Choices. All is God's will, is it not? The only thing is to choose God's will. Alton didn't answer for a while, as if he didn't hear. Then he asked, How do you know God's will? But everything just is, Fergic said. Alton smiled a little, and the evil look was gone from his face. Everything just is, he repeated. I stroked Deirdre's hair and grew calmer. All will be well, I murmured in Deirdre's ear. Alton stood up and said, I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. His jovial, genial, saintly air was replaced by the demeanour of a tough, tired old man. He walked a little way into the cave. I banked the fire 
and then started to pack, leaving by the fire a bag of oats and a skin of milk. When Alton was snoring, I began to pack the mule. What are you doing? Fergic asked. I told him quietly about Ewan, Endivain, and the scar. Fergic looked flabbergasted. And just go back. No, go on. Fergic looked even more stunned. How will we know the way? Why? He said to follow the stream. He grabbed my arm as I tried to tie our things onto the mule. He's a kindly old man and no more. We can't leave him. He's tough and has been travelling alone. He knows the way. He'll expect us to go back, so we'll go ahead. I tied the knot. You are mad. Then we'll go ahead without you. He made a fist and raised it over his head in an impotent gesture. I won't let you go on alone. Let's only think about this. I untied the mule from the tree. It's the best time to go while he's sleeping. We must hurry. I handed him the end of the rope and went to Deirdre, who drowsed by the banked fire. We're going on, I whispered. Deirdre's slightless eyes rose upward. Go in now. I don't want to frighten you, but I saw his scar. I'm sure it's a mistake. He is kind, she said. We must go. Don't argue. I put my hand under Deirdre's arm and helped her up. The stream wound in great bends, and I felt it was likely taking us twice as long to leave the woods this way. We came out just as the sun broke over misty fields, and there were houses in the distance. The mule stopped here and wouldn't go further, almost kicking Fergic while it hungrily browsed. We should find hospitality here, he said, with a mixture of uncertain hope and impatience at the turn of events. But can they be trusted? I asked. He gave me a stony look. We must replenish and rest and get directions to the coast if we must go. He looked down and kicked a rock. He was just an old man. Only an old man. We sat in silence at the edge of the fields. The mist only grew heavier, and the sun didn't seem to rise any higher. I closed my eyes and nodded off, exhausted from walking all night. I awoke to voices and opened my eyes. A boy and girl in their teens had come and were already talking with Fergic. I nudged Deirdre, who was asleep beside me. The boy and girl saw us rising and quickly turned to greet us. We are Haven Liam, the girl said. She was a short, slight girl with blonde hair flowing over her shoulders. She wore a necklace of river pearls and beads, and her dress was fine. The boy smiled. He was also slight, with long brown hair. He was holding a flute. Liam said, Come to the house. My wife will give you porridge. Have laughed shyly. He does like to say, my wife. You are newly wedded? I asked. We started to walk across the field. Aye, the feast ended last night. It was all gaiety. You will be our first guests. As we walked, Liam played his flute. I looked about. The fields had been sown. There were five houses and a barn. No one was about. Where is your family? I asked. Sleeping it off, Liam said. Before the feast, we worked hard to get in the sewing. We went into a very small house that was newly built. It had two rooms, a table with two stools by the fire. Deirdre and I sat on the stools, and Fergic leaned against the wall. Have put a pot on the fire to boil the porridge. You're going to the coast? Liam asked. To the island of Iona, the monastery, I said. My brother is there. How far is it? I've never been, but my father fished on the coast when he was young. Have was in the shadows, fetching the water and barley. After measuring the barley into the boiling water, she appeared with a skin that had been hanging on a peg. She poured milk from it into the pot. It caught my eye, and I looked at the skin in Have's hands. It was exactly the skin I had left for Alton. We are your first guests, I asked. Oh, yes, Have said. She gave Liam a quick look. No one comes through the wood, and no one comes from the sea in winter. 
I hope it's late enough in the season for you to travel by boat. There was silence. I drew in my breath. Do you know an old man named Alton? I asked. Liam smiled easily and furrowed his brow to consider it. That name isn't familiar to me. He might have known my father, but my father died over the winter. I'm very sorry to hear it. Have gave a bowl of porridge to Fergic and a bowl to Deirdre and me to share, and gave us each a piece of bread. We ate hungrily and in silence while Liam played the flute. We've walked all night and are very tired, I said. Is there some place we could rest for today? Come to the barn, Liam said. Have took up a lamp and we went out. It was a warm, humid day, and rain was coming. The barn was close by, a small, dark building with no windows. We went inside, and in the dark I could half see and half sense the menfolk gathered inside, who surrounded us and stood in front of the door. The small light from the lamp created a haze through which shadows moved. "'What's this?' Fergic asked. "'You mean harm to our kin, Olten,' a man said, "'and you're to stay in here until we know what to do.' Deirdre grabbed me around the waist. "'Don't be foolish,' I snapped at them. "'If we meant him harm, we wouldn't have run away from him.' I told what I knew about Yvain and the scar. The man who had spoken folded his arms implacably. "'I don't know any Yvain. "'I know you chased the old man Olten through the woods all night.' Have spoke. "'He is my uncle.' His late wife was my mother's sister. Her brothers took his land, and we are too small to fight for it back. I wrung my hands. Then it was a mistake, and I was wrong. Surely you understand my confusion. Some folk create confusion for their own ends, the man said. What would I want from him? I asked. Perhaps to please the cousins who took his land. For some reward you would kill him. Shut up now. Our king is away, and when he comes back, we'll ask for his judgment. They filed out and barred the door behind them, leaving us in almost complete darkness. Have left the lamp for us on a shelf by the door. Fergic flopped down in the straw and sighed loudly, but said nothing. I took Deirdre's hand, and we sat down together. He does mean mischief. Why else would he deceive them into thinking we meant him harm? I asked. Fergic sighed again, and I knew to stop talking. There was nothing to do but try to sleep, so we stretched out and closed our eyes. I felt the rhythm of walking still vibrating in me. The straw was fresh and sweet-smelling and slightly intoxicating. My head spun. Exhausted, I fell into a deep sleep. Through my sleep, I heard the storm. A cold draft passed over me, and I curled up tighter. If there was anything to hear or sense, it was swallowed by thunder and rain. When I awoke, I knew hours had passed. The lamp had blown out, and it was pitch dark. I lay still and heard Fergic's light snoring. Something seemed missing. I didn't hear Deirdre's breathing. I stretched my arms and felt around. Deirdre wasn't beside me. I got on my hands and knees and crawled, unable to see in the pitch black, feeling for her. Deirdre? I whispered. Deirdre? Fergic awoke with a snort. What is it? Deirdre? I called. I stumbled through the straw, pushing through it. He's taken her. That was what he wanted. We rushed to the door and hurled ourselves against it. It was no longer barred, and we crashed out of the barn into the night. We had slept all day, and now it was dark and raining heavily. We could just make out the white stone foundation of Liam and Have's cottage, and we ran to their door, pounding on it and shouting, not much louder than the storm. After a time that seemed forever, Have came to the door with a lamp in her hand. What are you doing here? He's taken her. He wanted her and he took her while we slept. Have went into the house's other room and knocked on the door, calling Alton. 
Then she opened it. The room was empty. Liam took the lamp, put it on the table, and looked wrathfully at us. I don't know what trickery you practice, but if it's true, and her spell on him has deceived him to this, there's nothing to do now. We have to find them! A clap of thunder shuddered through the house. You're mad. There's no way to follow anyone in this storm. I turned and ran outside, leaving Fergic in the house with Liam and Have. I bolted across the fields toward the woods from which we had come. Flashes of lightning made the woods jump toward me as I ran. Deirdre! Deirdre! I shouted, and the wind pushed back my voice. I heard something. A cry tossed in the wind. I couldn't tell which direction it came from. In flashes of light, branches shook wildly. The trees bent in the wind. Through the booming thunder came the crashing sound of branches breaking and falling. The wind whipped off my hood and blew wet hair across my eyes as I ran slipping across the drowned field. I arrived where the stream came out of the woods. The rushing water shone in the dark, and what had been a quiet stream that morning now roared with fury. I shouted for Deirdre again. I was sure I heard a voice. I stood still, trying to concentrate on the direction it came from. The voice of my daughter seemed to come from just within the wood, and I followed the stream into the trees. A branch crashed in front of me, and I slid and stumbled over it. I'm here, Deirdre called. I'm coming. I scrambled down the bank and into the water, which was up to my knees, and tripped and stumbled over the slippery stones, cutting my ankles and hands as I stumbled ahead. My foot got wedged between two rocks, the water and mud sucking it down. I pulled my foot out of one shoe, then the other. I pulled myself up the other bank toward the voice of my daughter. The clouds were lifting now, the moon peeked out, and I could just see Deirdre sitting below an oak. I crawled up the slope, tearing hunks of moss. I'm here, I said at last, falling onto my daughter and throwing my arms around her. I don't know where he's gone, Deirdre said. I'm not hurt. I clutched Deirdre close and stifled a sob. You aren't hurt, I asked. No. He carried me off and dragged me here. Then he ran his hands over my body and cried out that he had nothing, nothing left in the world. Then he disappeared. Lightning flashed, and I pulled Deirdre away from the tree, looking upward. Then I saw it, and mouthed a prayer, my breath still panting. Above us, Alton was hanging from the tree. He's killed himself. Pray to God for his soul, I said. We trudged back to Liam and Have's cottage. Have stirred porridge over the fire, and Liam was sitting up in the bed, whittling a stick. Fergic was on the bed beside him, and his feet and hands tied together. I see you found her, Liam said in an uninterested voice. He hanged himself in a tree to prevent his sinning, I said. Liam stopped and sharpened his knife on a small stone. Then it's a bad business and you should be on your way. You can have a bowl of porridge first and then leave. It's not hard to find the sea from here. Go west. Liam untied Fergic. We ate the porridge in silence. Then Liam spoke again as he set down his bowl. We'll keep the mule as your payment for Alton's life, he said. Fergic glared at me. As you say, was all Fergic said. Your things are in the barn. Take them and go. We each carried what we could in bundles on our backs. The rope that Alton had hanged himself with was the rope that had held our things onto the mule's back and made a lead for the animal. Perhaps we should get our rope? I said. Fergic's eyes popped. The rope? 
with the curse of the most mortal sin on it. We might be able to trade it for food later. There's no food I can't catch. I won't hand on this sin to an unsuspecting Christian. We might need it, I said. This was the beginning of a long time when I could only feel a great coldness and stiffness in my belly. Fergic regarded me, glanced at Deirdre, who was biting her lip. What am I doing taking this mad woman and her ill-omened daughter on this mad errand? He said to the floor. He looked up again. We should go back and quit this. Just then, voices and treading feet headed toward the barn. Liam and some men entered carrying Alton's body on a board. They set it down. You're still here, Liam asked with exasperation. The rope was hanging over his shoulder. The path that leads west from the barn connects with another. Follow it to a small lake. That will take you until nightfall. Perhaps someone there will take you in and guide you further to the coast. I reached out and grasped the rope in my fingers. It slid off his shoulder. I only was waiting for my rope, I said. The group of men stepped back in horror. To be continued. If you enjoy Continuous Stream, please give us a five star rating on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. For other ways to support the show, please see the show notes or visit www.continuousstream.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>